So welcome everyone for my session. I'm going to speak about why going open source, another session on this topic that we already talked about so many times. My name is Peter Šmolovic. You can see my Twitter handle and my blog on the screen. I am been at MS for 21 years. There's a little trick here. Out of these 21 years, 10 years has been the Microsoft MS and 11 years has been the Morgan Stanley MS. There are similarities between the two companies, not that sticker symbol, of course, but uh, let's stop there. Open source. I have been involved with open sourcing much longer than these 21 years. I have been open sourcing with projects like uh, Velocity, projects like Hibernate, uh, and many other over the years. I tried many, many different size firms. I went from uh, small startups to big enterprises. I've been from database architect to uh, normal architect. I tried everything. I've been to FMCG and all these different firms. And I did uh, everything from engineering to more or less R&D. I did work on some hardware R&D, uh, some software R&D, and so on. So another topic I want to mention here that I do have some favorite projects I worked on. I happen to have the beautiful opportunity to work with uh, Andrew Heisberg on C the language C Sharp, with some wonderful people to work on Visual Studio, uh, with some other people to work on stuff in uh, Azure, uh, or on a Morgan Stanley project called Compose. What is the common in these uh, things that I listed here that I loved working on, that they do involve open source in one way or the other. But that's about me. Let's talk about the topic that we came here, which is why going open source? So let's say you are an enterprise. You want to say, I want to go open source because it has a marketing value. So for example, I have to say, Morgan Stanley has more than 35 active projects on GitHub. That is a good uh, marketing value. Of course, you can say, sure, it's a very nice hiring vehicle. Morgan Stanley do have more than 35 pro uh, projects on GitHub, and this is a very good uh, marketing and hiring value. And of course, you can say, uh, because it's used by many others, actually, we are not sure whether all these more than 35 projects is actively being used uh, as the open source project. And there's a big question. How do you are going to know that they are going to be used? Is this even an important question to know whether they are going to be used? I think the answer for this is a very complex sentence. Is the foundation architecture aspiration of a pluggable platform? Okay, again, what? What did you just say? So for me, when you are pluggable, and pluggable in a say in the way that not only pluggable in an open source component way, but pluggable even in a closed component sources way, you don't really know when you start your open source project whether it's going to be used. And actually, that question is not necessarily the important part. Sometimes this open source project is not really for you to figure out people who are going to use it. Rather, and I will talk about some of the other use cases we found, why doing open source is important, what other benefits an open source project might be having. Beside, you are able to say that it's a marketing value, it has a hiring value, and it has a usable value, what other big benefits it might have had. And the other thing is, your company does not necessarily have to own every line of the code that, that you have. This is an interesting approach. Uh, is it a problem if I don't own it? Yes, we know about supply, supply chain attacks and the other problems that might come if you don't own every line of the code. But all those problems can be mitigated, should be mitigated anyway, because you are going to use open source components anyway. So these have to be looked at. So after these two things, I can say that if your architecture, you plan it to be a pluggable architecture in a way that you are able to allow either an open source or a closed source, uh, even proprietary, even something you might be paying for a com by a commercial vendor, vendor to be able to plug it in. That is really the problem. Uh, that is really the solution for this whole problem about whether my project is going to be used. OK, this problem now aside, let's talk about what I actually came to talk about. Why going open source? Let's say there is a vendor. I'm not going to name the vendor. This vendor really wants to sell uh, their stuff to us. So this vendor came, 
looked around all the open source projects we have and found a project called desktop.js. Okay, this is not the slide, that, sorry. And one slide ahead. So being open source meant that vendor could look at the projects that we have and without any red tape, without signing any NDA, they could start integrating with us without waiting for all this to happen. So now comes the actual use case, sorry. So this was, there was this vendor, they tried to sell that control to us. So they looked around and they found a, a library called desktop.js. Desktop.js is a common API for you to write your application once and to run in different UI containers, whether that UI container is a proprietary one, whether it's an open source one, it's, it's up to you to use it. It allows you to write once and run in any of the container. So what this vendor did, that they presented a sales demo. Why their sales demo they were showing, they actually explained this sales demo is using Desktop.js. And we said, oh, that's absolutely cool. Can you give us the URL you are just showing? They give up the URL and during their demo, we were able to take their application that they were demoing their control and put it into our internal proprietary solution and try it out. So th their sales demo, which was uh, totally isolated from a sales demo, became a sales demo we could very closely interact with it and, and live with it. And, and it, it became very close to us very, very quickly. Of course, after that, it was an instant win of both sides. It was an easy choice for us to try and, and to buy that solution because we already knew it's going to work in our proprietary uh, approach. This is one of the use cases that, that we have seen. Of course, I didn't come to show you only one use case. I came to show you multiple use cases. So let me talk about one of the other use cases. The other use case is that OSS is a tool to work with the industries. Okay, what does it mean? O open sourcing enables you to outsource and buy features of the shelf that gives a commercial momentum for a faster delivery. What does it mean? You can get bonus brownie points for having a project in the open source that is useful for driving the roadmap of some other company than yours by being able to add the use cases that the FinServe developers would require. Yes, we are that different FinServe developers that we have to be taken consideration. And many of the vendors doesn't really understand that, doesn't really get what FinServe developers are different. So let me show you that use case now. Brian Ingenito and myself, we wrote a UI strategy, which has been presented through one of the open source projects called Compose. Uh, we actually sit down with one of the vendors and discussion based on this open source project and the whole UI strategy we presented there resulted in one of the vendors pivoting of their solution. And this is big. Actually, let me use a quote from uh, actually the VP of director of the project management from the company, Morgan Stanley helped influence us on the importance of having a strategy of hybrid style application that merge web technologies and native technologies. We who are just a customer of that company, we, we were able to influence their strategy, their long time strategy by us open sourcing some of our strategical uh, thinking. There are other companies, mostly tech companies, who have been doing this. I did actually work with tech companies who produces their internal strategic meetings to, to, to YouTube. We are not there yet. We are okay producing our US strategy to there. This is already a big thing. This cooperation actually resulted in a video showcase, showcase with that particular company, which has a very wide uh, viewership on YouTube. So we feel like it's a win-win for both sides. They have been able to tell that we have been, that they have been working with us, and we have been able to tell that they are doing something that's going to be usable for us. This was another thing, another use case for us. Let me talk another completely different use case now. When you are going open source, it does enable you to look at staff augmentation a different way. And I'm not speaking about trying to hire people from Fiverr or something to do your work, no, no, no. But still gives you a different way, a different approach to start working with companies that are in a, in a different situation. 
So because going this open source eliminates all the needs of onboarding, eliminates all the need of overhead, many cases the management overhead and so on, and does result in immediate participation of those staff augmented people in your processes. I'm going to bring an example for this as well. This is going to my, my use case three. So let me talk about Turntable. Turntable is a company which is in Ghana, in Accra, and they are doing uh, enterprise quality driven software consultancy there. Of course, any can, anyone can work with them, but to do that, you have to go to all the red tape and, and the processes and everything. And correct me if I am wrong, most companies does not have a working relationship with Ghana, the country, definitely. And it's, it's, it's not like working with a company in the UK. It's going to be usually much harder than just, hey, I need a consultancy resource here and there. So what we did, that we are working with them because this is an opportunity to give back. Ghana is a place that you, you would like to give back. And if you are working in open source, this giving back is actually much easier. They have been working with us on a project called Crossroads. And actually based on the success of this project, now we are doing two more projects with them, also happening in the open source. So this is actually a big opportunity for for us because this gives us really uh, a kind of both feeling the giving back and getting quality resources in this way. There's still more. There are some more benefits. If you are going open source, this usually means that you are using open source and or standard tooling. If you are in using GitHub, let's say one of the open source vehicle that many people are using. This will mean that you are going to use the standard tooling that, uh, that is available for OSS. You are not going to use your company's internal tooling or internal approaches. This means that you are going to be more standard than, than even possible. It, it will allow, allow you to keep yourself outside of the, of the bindings that, that could have there to use your internal tooling. This is good, I'm telling you. By using this kind of off-the-shelf infrastructure pieces and GitHub, in our case, we are able to swiftly uh, uh, both adopt and leverage the industry-wide DevOps tooling ourselves. So this is for us one of the, I would say the fourth benefit next to the obvious ones, which is we are doing something that people are going to use. We are doing something which might be a hiring vehicle. We are doing something which does have a marketing value. This thing that it is allowing us to make sure that we are going to do something which is standard, which is something probably OSS as well, and not going to bind us or block us or, 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 or get us into a, lo a lockdown situation, uh, it will help, help us there. As originally this session was going to be a lightning talk, a 10 minutes lightning talk, I actually here to answer any of your questions there. I know this is a 30 minute session, but originally as I mentioned, it was for 10 minutes. So I'm open for any, any questions on our, on our approach. You can see our web page and our email address where you can ask questions about this. And again, sorry if you were hoping to hear about blockchain or legend, that's in the other room. Yeah, sure. So what's been the biggest challenge The question was, what is the biggest challenge adopting open source? Uh, it, it went in, in stages. First, first was the usage of open source, you know? Uh, many companies still don't really have a, a process for, for doing that. And actually having someone who is your head of open source is, is really help. That, that, that that's probably was one of the first thing uh, in Gab's presentation, there was this slide about how many companies do have a head of open source and not every company was able to say, yes, we do have a head of open source or actually some companies, but we do have, but I don't know who he is. So actually starting from the, with that, that's that first get to the point where you are able to use open source. That's really the point one. The second point is actually the, the legal. So uh, actually, there is, uh, pa uh, as part of this whole Finos uh, Foundation, there is a, a smaller group which is, which is talking about these legal challenges. And those are actually probably the biggest one. What are the paperwork needed 
to be able to, to go open source. Whether you are able to go open source natively or you are going to use some of the solutions which enables you to go like in a, in a sandbox, first semi open source, and when everything is okay, then actually doing the real commit, doing the real PR, doing the real change in the outside open source world. So actually, that I think is, is, is the biggest challenge to have someone at, 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 the, at the firm who is designated as the head of open source and do have actually the tools to, to achieve what, what he wants. So that person do have access to the light, right legal resources, to the right uh, technical resources, so it's able to, to do this. No, 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 no. They are not working free. So they are, they are consultancy resources. We are paying them as consultants. The, the giving back is really enabling them to work with a company like Morgan Stanley. Normally, a company like Morgan Stanley would need such a, a red tape and such a processes for, for hiring a company from Ghana that would be... So open source framework is just the vehicle. Open source is the vehicle there. Yeah, open source is the vehicle because we are able to tell them you are going to work on open source. Therefore, most of the red tape we would otherwise imply on you because you would be able to log into our systems. You would be able to make changes. You need the mandatory trainings and everything. Most of them doesn't really apply to them because they are not going to log into our systems. They are not going to make changes to our systems. They would work on an open source project. Sure. More questions? Sure. For, for that Yeah, so the question was about uh, how this work with an open source, uh, with a company like this and going to the public cloud can work together. They don't have to work together hand in hand. If they, if they happen together, it's actually a big boost for the whole approach. They don't have to. The project that we did work uh, is actually a specialized build tool uh, that we created, not cloud specific. And the new projects that we are working on also not cloud specific tools. These are more about uh, desktop development tools that they are working on. If we would uh, have these projects connected with the public cloud, a different problem would arise how they are going to have and who is going, who would be paying for the subscription in the public cloud. If your company is paying for the subscription, that means actually then you again fall into the whole red tape situation because if they are using your subscription, all the liabilities actually is going to be yours and not theirs. So I can see benefits going to the public cloud there, but also at the same time, I, I can see why it might actually not really help you, rather the opposite. Of course, uh, the question was, what is the future stage of open source? I am not the head of open source at Morgan Stanley. Uh, I do see the head of open source at Morgan Stanley in the room. <laughs> so I'll be very careful in the next few sentences I'm going to make. So as I mentioned, we already have more than 35 projects on, on, the, on open source. We are actually looking into increasing these numbers and where we are increasing, we are not shooting for the numbers, we are shooting for the quality. So we are not definitely not looking for the quantity. Uh, what we are trying to do, we are trying to get into areas we haven't uh, been involved yet. So we are looking at things that we haven't uh, been done in the, in the open source world, whether it is in, in areas like uh, desktop computing or whether it's uh, er so areas that we haven't done yet. And we feel like that we do have the uh, competitive advantage that we can turn into an open source project. Also, going back to the use cases, many of the cases we see a value of, of going open source there, where it would help us working with other vendors.
So that's really, we, we are trying to move open source more as a, as a vehicle for many of the use cases you have seen. Instead of just being able to say, it is open source now, because that's not really a value anymore. Everybody's doing that. <laughs> No, it's actually different. So when we are owning, fully owning a project, in some way that's, that's easier because then we control everything. We control the license, we control who can contribute to it, we can control everything. When you are actually contributing to someone else's open source projects, you do provide the PR and what happens if someone takes your commits, not your PR, just your commits, so your uh, legal disclaimer is missing them and takes those commits and merge it. Now, what does it mean from you, from the legal perspective? They didn't merge your PR, so your disclaimer is not part of the, the, their code base, but they did pick your, your commits. So, uh, yes, it's very nice to be able to contribute individual pieces to, to other projects, but generally, uh, it might be, a, from the governance point of view, it actually might be a harder one. And actually, uh, I don't know whether you have met the toxicity sometimes you find in open source projects, especially maintained by smaller, not companies, maintained by indi individuals, it might be not even a bad, uh, might be not even a good experience for your for your people. So it might. Yeah, that's the other point. Yeah. So yes, uh, many cases we actually contribute to. Uh, external projects, projects just in this year, I think we are close to 200 now, just this year, but uh, in some way we might prefer actually open sourcing projects ourselves because that, pro that process, just from the government's perspective and just from the, uh, the level of anxiety the people who are doing it might be an easier one. Yeah, I, I would say. So we, we have been using open source for quite a while. That has been always the, the case. Actually, we started first contributing PR. So we, we, we started that way that there were a few cases. We saw, oh, that project is very nice. We need one extension point that's missing for them. Let me just add the ability to add one extension point to, the, to that project. We figured out what is the uh, process for doing that. We did it. We learned from the process this way. Uh, then came the point where we figured out that it might be valuable for us to start contributing back full, full projects. So we started actually from, hey, this project needed one small thing for us to be perfect. And usually this was just an extension point that we put our proprietary pluggable part in it. Thinking back to the one of my slides when I was talking about the whole pluggable infrastructure point. I don't know whether I fully answered your question. I mean, we, we kept ourselves to the open source guidelines and uh, the how a uh, fork process is, is happening. So the answer is yes. I don't see the full room. I don't see whether there are any more hands. But if there are more hand, no more hands, then I'd like to thanks everyone for coming and joining me. Thank you.